agenda, approve the minutes of Thursday, October 20th. It was the board retreat. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the board retreat. Second. Is there any discussion on those minutes? All right, hearing none, so moved. Approve the minutes of Tuesday, October 25th. It was a regular board meeting. Make a motion to approve the October 25th minutes. So moved by Sarah, seconded by Rodney. Is there any discussion on those minutes? All right, so hearing none, so moved. Board correspondence slash communications. You can just say we received a complaint about policy A1 and some of the agenda. Um, we did receive a complaint about policy A1 and it is on the agenda for discussion and action tonight. Is there any other board correspondence that anybody needs? All right. Uh, public comment. Uh, seems like we have some public on. So I'll go through. Um, um, I have a Fleet Davis. Do you have any public comment? Um, Hillary Hoffman. Hi, sorry, it took me a minute to turn on my camera and my microphone. Um, I did have a public comment to offer, but was going to wait until after. Um, are there two public comment periods or is this the only one? Just one tonight. Just one. Okay. Um, and, and what's the rule for public comment? Is it three minutes? Uh, usually I try to keep it to one minute, but one minute. Okay. We have a fairly good sized agenda to get through. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly speak as a resident of Royalton and a parent of three children who are currently attending the White River School District and one who's graduated from um, the White River School District. Um, I wanted to speak and address the board and ask the board to dismiss the complaint that has been, um, I guess you could say filed. I'm not sure what the, what the procedure is, but presented to the board. Um, I'm in addition to being a parent um, and resident, I'm also an attorney. I'm licensed in Vermont. I've read through the complaint and I don't um, see a basis for this complaint that's described in the complaint itself. So I don't see any rule or policy specific to um, the supervisory union or the school board that has been alleged to be violated in this complaint. Um, I think that anyone who's been paying attention to the conversation that's been going on in the broader community understands that um, the complainant in this case has a disagreement with a school board member over um, a policy position that that school board member has adopted and has spoken publicly about. Um, to me, that's not something that um, that should be um, punished or sanctioned or receive consequences in any way. Um, I think as an attorney, the first things that come to my mind are the First Amendment rights of all of the members of our community. Um, I think whenever the a government body starts to consider taking action that in any way limits or um, or or uh, possibly chills the free speech rights of a community member, that that's a really sort of slippery slope to walk down. So that's one reason that I would encourage um, the dismissal of this complaint. I also wanted to express my support for um, the school board member uh, to whom and against whom this complaint has been filed. I understand that um, the facts and circumstances of this case go far beyond this complaint and that this board member has been subject to other conduct outside the context of the school board that I find highly objectionable and highly concerning. So um, in short, um, I, I, um, <coughs> I'm requesting um, that the supervisor union dismiss this complaint. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 
Kate Jarvis. Do you have any public comment, Kate? No, I didn't raise my hand to speak. I've already filed my complaint. So I've said what I need to say at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Marty? Good evening. Um, I have no comment. Thank you, Marty. Um, Michelle Sama? Thank you, Michelle. Do you have an unknown caller on if there's any comment you would like to make? Thank you, Maggie. Now we have Maggie. If you have to go, Marianne, it's okay. Uh, unknown caller, last call. Is that everybody? Um, so just to add, I know Marianne, there was a, a mention of you being able to go. Um, when we do get to one of our action items, one of our voting members have to recuse themselves and that would put us not having a quorum to take action. So if you can stay on, I'd greatly appreciate it. The um, quick, you have my report in hand, lots of great stuff happening around the SU. Um, I did want to just mention um, that there's a couple discussion items that I'll be able to provide some updates on uh, under discussion in that I sent you all a note. Lincoln has been um, the motion on the Lincoln conversation was that they'll become their own supervisory district board uh, moving forward and operational for July 1. So that conversation is over at this time. Um, and I'll take any questions folks may have. It's hard to believe it's already November 22nd. It is the fastest school year I have experienced thus far, maybe just because I'm not doing COVID calls all weekend long, but it is flying. I just wanted to um, thank Jamie for his hard work and, and Tara and everybody else in the central office um, around the Lincoln um, uh, school district. Um, it was really, you were, you were great and really appreciate all the hard work you put into that. Thank you. I would agree to that. I know there was also a, a bunch of community members who um, sent their letters uh, to the big board. Um, and I, I fully believe that their participation was also very helpful, very helpful. in um, swaying the mind of the board. So um, my gratitude to them. Thank you for that. Uh, Bill, you had your hand up? Yeah, hi. I just wanted to mention that um, last week was a wildcat night at the White River Valley High School. And they invited all eighth graders to come to the high school and meet uh, fellow students, get a tour, uh, have the wonderful food, uh, and meet a number of teachers um, and their specialties. And I had the um, privilege of, of attending that. And, and this is one of the things that we talked about. I know it's big as a priority that we explain and show what a great facility and great teaching institution we have, and we encourage students that are moving ahead after eighth grade to strongly consider um, our high school as, as a, a suitable choice. And I was impressed with who I met and talked with, and I just wanted to um, thank those that convened that and encourage that to continue, because it's, as we all agree, is very, very important. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. I'm glad you were able to go. The RUD board members and I were in a, a board meeting that night, so we didn't get <laughs> yeah. to see it, but thank you. Right. Any other questions or discussion for Jamie? Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. 
Chief Academic Officer. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you also have my report. Um, the and sort of the highlights there are that we continue to expand our system of supports for all students. We're in the midst of another sort of six week cycle. They're not all like, not every school down the exact same six week cycle, but in terms of um, monitoring progress of students and ensuring that we're um, sort of targeting what skills they they may need and um, and doing intervention that way, we've been meeting with uh, interventionists and their principals and the and the data teams uh, to continue to build that uh, out at each of our schools. Um, in terms of proficiency-based learning, again, we're working on that at all of our levels. And uh, the middle school math team started a couple of weeks ago and met again yesterday. The high school will be meeting again in the beginning of December, working on their proficiencies and uh, elementary teachers. Uh, are uh, right now getting very familiar with their new report cards. Some of which, some of which will look very familiar, and some which has a little bit new. Um, I'm fielding questions from teachers looking for just um, support around what you know proficiency might mean. Are they interpreting it the way that uh, others are? And so we're doing a lot of um, support that way, just to ensure that folks know uh, what are the kind of the end goals that we're looking for uh, in each grade level. Um, and then I think the the last piece. Uh, is around um, the updates on the assessment system and the, the state assessment. And I, um, Superintendent sent out a message last week to our community uh, with the most updated information we have on Cognia, which is what's replacing Smarter Balance or SBAC. Um, and we continue to have just about that much information. What we have, we've shared with you around uh, the new assessment. We um, anticipate being trained uh, at the SU level in January on it uh, and then being able to roll that out to our buildings hopefully in February and so uh, folks will feel ready for the state summit of testing window which opens in April this year. Happy to take any questions on anything in the report or anything else that's come up. Anybody got any questions for Anda? Hi. Hi, Stacey. I didn't see um, <laughs> Thank you, Anda. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been doing some. Uh, so I, I will. I like what I have read about Cognia, which is not very much. There's just there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information out there yet for the public. Um, I did read an article, I think, in the, the Burlington Free Press about the state's um, efforts to map. SBAC scores somehow onto Cognia so that we would have some fluidity in how we're measuring. And I wondered if you could speak to that at all. That's a that's basically what we have heard that <laughs> part of the um, part of the contract with Cognia is that they will do that work okay. to show sort of how the new assessment um, aligns to sort of levels of performance in the in the previous assessment. So I. Um, that, that's part of their sort of scope of work that they're they're uh, expected to do, um, and I'm guessing that will come out sort of after all of the Vermont students take it this spring, and then they can map it on. So I don't know if that will, I don't know how that will affect the timing of which when all the results will come out. We've certainly had sort of delayed timing on on Smarter Balance um, side, which I don't know if that's a Smarter Balance thing or if it's a Vermont thing, um, but that that you could imagine that might impact when we see the results statewide for the next one if they're trying to do that mapping ahead of time. Sure. I guess I'm a little concerned that we've put so much effort into being able to track kids and I, I you know, I'm sure that I'm not alone in the worry that this is starting, having to start all over and start to collect several years more worth of that. Yeah. Um, so I will continue. But please, if anything else comes up, if you would share it with us. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, uh, two questions. One is on track my progress. It, it sounds like that it's a viable measurement tool that really provides credible, useful, specific information that teachers can use and our support teams can use to help the kids move forward. Um, and I just wanted to uh, have you tell us whether um, this is an instrument that you have faith and confidence in 
uh, moving forward, or is it a possibility that you know every other year we're going to be moving on to something else? How, how do you score that instrument right now, Anna? And then I'll give you a second question. Uh, so I do. I don't have um, any uh, plans to to change the benchmark assessment that we're using. Uh, I do think it's giving us really um, valuable data, particularly at the student and classroom level, in terms of understanding sort of how students um, are grappling with the material that's at their grade level, um, you know, where they've got their strengths and where they need some more support. Uh, and I, our teachers and um, interventionists and administrators have been sort of get, becoming more and more familiar with that, especially with the schools and districts that it's new to this fall. Um, so I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that we'll, we have any plans to change that if nothing changes on track my progress's side. Uh, I can't guarantee any companies these days. Um, and I think what we, what's uh, also encouraging is that they are working on some additional materials and, um, and tools that we might be able to use. We've tried out a, um, a diagnostic, which you might use with uh, not all students, like we use the benchmark, but you would use with some students to get some more information. Uh, they are developing one for the English language arts side that should be ready, um, I've heard, in February. So I think as their tools also continue to develop, um, it'll become an increasingly more useful tool for us uh, as long as we're able to um, align those directly to what sort of actions we take with those tools. Thank you. Uh, second question has to do with the mood, the feeling um the feedback from our universal instruction teachers and our interventionists and our special education uh, support team um, they've had a chance to see the results of the fall testing uh, they've convened in teams uh, they've analyzed it um, what's the mood out there is it, do we have a is our team feeling that these scores not only must improve, but will improve because they have a sense of how to do it and they have the teamwork to accomplish moving us forward in, in, in achievement. What's, what's, what can you tell us out there, Anna? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Bill. I think uh, in general, uh, our teachers express a lot of uh, optimism for what they and our students are able to do together. I think in places where they we see uh, growth, there's certainly excitement around that, particularly around areas uh, that we've had um, some really good attention in the last year or two. Uh, I've maybe pull out, for instance, um, kind of early elementary math, uh, where we I think our, our students are really benefiting from having a um, consistent approach from even pre-K to K to first grade. And second grade, we're seeing the results of that. Uh, I think in places where the performance level of performance is uh, lower than we would like, and maybe even than we expected, there's um, a sense of, all right, we've got to really dig into this and what other additional supports do we need? I think in some cases we've had folks reach out and say, I'm not quite sure what to do next. I have tried this and this and this, uh, and I need, I need something else to happen. And so in those conversations, we're looking at some professional development, we're looking at other other schools inside or outside of RSU who might um, be using a, a similar curriculum approach um, that we could go do some observations. Uh, so we're kind of reaching out at different levels. In my report, I talk about sort of the multiple ways that we're sort of tackling some of these, um, some of the gaps that we have. And that's, I think, both through uh, being really clear on proficiencies, getting in better materials uh, in front of our teachers and students, um, really upping the game on professional learning. Uh, and then also using data to make uh, better decisions. So I think those four prongs are really important and they're all sort of pulling um, hopefully in the same direction. Uh, and in different places, we're sort of relying on one or more of them in different ways. Um, so it's always hard to capture sort of the, the 10 different schools in, in one, um, one tone, but I think uh, in general, that's, that's where we are. Uh, and we certainly know there's, and our teachers and administrators know that there's more work to be done certainly in a couple of really particular areas. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys. Anything else, Rhonda? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. You also have my uh, my report, and just something new that I wanted to start this month was um, was just doing like a spotlight on uh, on. Um, 
the, the new rule changes that are currently taking place and then um, you know one or two that are, are coming next July just because there are so many um, I just thought I, I know I've even given you the link where it has all the comparisons and it's a really long list but I just thought a nice little spotlight um, on some that are super duper important um, would just be really helpful so my first um, spotlight for this month is just the parental input section which um, really what that is is on the IEP itself they um, now have included um, on the present level page uh, an actual section that says parental input which gives parents um, an opportunity in the meeting to just have their voice about what they think um, is important for the team to know that maybe wasn't already discussed um, but then also um, when the meeting um, is over and they receive a copy of the IEP in the mail, there's actually a parental input form um, that goes home that the top section is almost like a, a small reflection about the process itself, like how it felt for them, how it went for them. And then there's a bottom section that again gives another opportunity um, for them to give any sort of feedback um, or information to the team that they think would be important that may or may not need to be included in the IEP. Um, just because some parents, you know, when they attend meetings can be a little shy or they feel intimidated or whatnot um, at the meeting. So just kind of giving them some private time to write something down um, is just like another, another outlet. Um, so I think it's actually a wonderful um, addition to the process. So that's the parental input section. Um, and then I included, because we had started talking about in October, um, about um, the possible position of um, like a 50, section 504 coordinator or whatnot. And I said I would just kind of dig up some information. So I included that in my report as well. Currently in, in what we call DocuSpend, which is like our database system, um, there are 64 section 504 plans um, in there. So that's SU wide. Um, the largest number being uh, at the high school with 24 students. Um, I did also sent out kind of a, a you know, a, a poll to some of our directors here in the area, um, just asking them, you know, if they have a position that's similar to this, um, you know, what does that look like? You know, what do their numbers um, look like? Um, I did get some responses back. Um, and they all do have a position that's similar. Again, we all know the titles are different um, everywhere you go. Some do call it a 504 coordinator, some call it something else. Um, but the main focus, what I found um, hearing back from everyone, is that their main focus is high school. They all have more plans, Section 504 plans, at the high school level. Um, so what the person focuses on is case managing at the high school level, um, but then working on compliance at the other levels and training, making sure everyone is properly trained, filtering through all everyone's questions that come through on a daily basis, um, et cetera. So that's what um, you know those that particular position works on in other districts. And the numbers range. Um, when I talked to the director and Mop Hillier, their person has 65. Um, they can't manage 65, which 65 would be pretty much our entire supervisory union at this point. Um, there are still plans being um, uploaded, you know, on a what feels like a biweekly basis. Um, but other other districts, they just like they contract or they give like stipends um, to what they feel is student leaders um, or teacher leaders to uh, case manage plans, um, but there's no kind of training or compliance or anything affiliated with that. It's just it's just straight case management. Um, so yeah, so it really it really varied. Um, but the thing that was consistent was that it, they all did focus just on case managing high school. Um, and that they really did focus on kind of compliance um, also um, around that position. So that's what was consistent. Um, so just some things to think about when you know Tara does the budget um, later on. Yeah, any questions?
Good evening, everyone. You have my report, which outlines the happenings in the business office throughout the month of December. So I'll answer any questions you have on that. Otherwise, I'll come back later. Any questions, guys? Okay. Okay. As I uh, bring up my report, uh, you've heard about the transition from SBAC to Cognia. So my department will help support in that. And uh, also supporting the new elementary report cards. We had a uh, good training for teachers yesterday. Good feedback on that. And um, it looks like our ADM is up about 2%. So. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll take 2%. It's in the right direction. Not across the SU, and uh, I will entertain uh, any questions. Couldn't get five, right? <laughs> <laughs> I believe we counted every student. We are. We'll take two. All right. To the right direction. Policy committee update. We had a policy committee meeting right before this meeting. Maggie, do you want to put in our? Put Maggie right on the spot. Put you right on the spot, Maggie. You've been our spokesperson. You're doing a great job, so I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> I did. Are you, uh -huh. you have the right you have the right person? <laughs> she did it before. Yeah. Sylvia's done it too. Well, it it. It. Yeah, this time. Well, I'm, I'm glad I finished my supper. Um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't have you got here late, so isn't that how that works? You give it to the that you get assigned things when you're not here yet. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I was coughing right in into the microphone my apologies okay so the policy uh committee continues to explore the concept of flags and perhaps differentiating what is a flag what is a banner um there was some so we had um uh the one of the lawyers who actually wrote the policy join us today to help clarify um what was written so far and one of the directives that we or directions actually that we we went in after last month's meeting was um after a question came up about the supreme court ruling regarding a school in boston that had a flag policy and concern of perhaps we should just limit um our flag poles to flying the United States flag and the Vermont flag only. What we understood then from the lawyer, Marilyn, I can't remember her last name, um, was that the school in Boston had maybe three flag poles. And so the last flag pole held um, some, um, there was conflict there because the way that they had written it, anyone could fly a flag uh, regardless. And there was some concern of, you know, are we, what are we walking ourselves into? Where, where it seems to stand right now, and please folks direct me if I'm uh, going the wrong way, um, is that we are wondering, are, if the language should be written of flags flown inside the school or outside the school, is a flag limited to a flagpole? And if it's not a f on the flagpole, is it a banner? And then do we have we have language for that? And um, and then just clarifying the policy or the procedures rather of how someone a student group would move toward putting like requesting to fly their flag and they would have um you know to articulate why it's important what it represents so they have to do they have some things some processes to go through but it's not so overwhelming that a student group couldn't do that 
Um, right now, I think, oh, and then where, where does the decision get made? Is it the individual school boards making the decision about the flag or banner? Or is it ultimately like the supervisory union that helps make the decision um, within the, with, for the local boards? It seems that we're a little conflicted. In ter there's not, I don't know if conflicted is the right word, but we're not um, unanimous with um, people's hopes and concerns. And so conversations are still happening and we're gonna come back next month to talk more about flags versus banners within or without. And I think we left it, Stacy or Shannon or whoever was else was there. I was on the phone, so I, I couldn't see everyone. Um, yeah, are we um, keeping, is it going to be written for the school board making the decision or the local boards? Um, I don't think, or are we exploring both? I think is where we're landing. And we do have, Stacy is also going to check for us to see other schools that have policies, find out how it's going for them and if any, any issues are coming up so we can kind of know about that. But I think you nailed it, Maggie. That's pretty much where we are. Um, we don't have a flag policy yet, but we're, we're working toward figuring out what that looks like for us. And we'll keep bringing you back more information as we continue. But thank you, Maggie. Sorry I, you know, I, I actually <laughs> respond well when I don't have a lot of time to overthink. I'm just glad that I didn't have kale in my teeth. <laughs> you were great. Bill? No, hi, Maggie. Thank you for uh, that a summary of, of the hard work of the policy committee. Um, I'm aware, I think there's been two drafts that I've been shared with me. One was dated in September and that we had informal conversation at, at the SU level. And then I believe the community, the policy committee reconvened, talked about it more, had legal counsel, um, uh, counsel and have a draft here that's dated November. And so, and I was looking at the two of them and they, it looks like you've made some, some um, substantial changes uh, in language and in scope. And I'm wondering whether you might highlight um, the major differences between the first draft and the second draft, where you're, where, where you're going with that. Uh, and in particular, I was looking at the whole question about the policy on uh, using our flagpole that currently has the American flag and the state flag for other flags. And um, I had to read it very, very, very carefully. And I think I've figured out what the second draft is is uh, all about, but I, I needed to hear from you. I, Bill, I don't, um, thank you for the, the compliment of thinking that I understand all the nuances of the language shift. Um, I, I don't. Um, and some of that is because I was operating on a phone call, so it was hard to read the document yeah. on my phone. I, it does work better in landscape, by the way. Um, that said, <clears throat> I think, I think that we are trying to establish like uh, is the flag flown within or without the building because there are schools. Well, there are some districts with no schools and there are some districts with schools with no flagpoles. Um, and there are some districts with schools and flagpoles. So we've got a lot of options. And so the language needs to be able to be um, specific to each entity so that um, you know they're they're reflecting their community more appropriately and so how that nuance shift happens um i i'm i don't know that i could go through but i bet um i bet jamie would love to he's kind no. of a master at this. no i don't know no, no master <laughs> so so bill i think what the the what i would say is the big piece is the committee it has not voted this last draft out of out of committee and so I think they're still, they're going to actually, they requested some wordsmithing to this draft for a third draft. Um, so actually, it probably would be the fourth because that, that original flag policy had two. So I think it's important to know that this one still is in committee and they have not taken any action to then vote it out of committee. 
to have it be read by any of the boards or right. provided comment yet. So this is still in draft form at committee level. The one of the things that the committee's looking at and going to discuss next month as well is if you read that current November draft, it could possibly be perceived. And one of the things we asked our attorney to get clearer about is could each district board actually designate where the display of the flag actually happens? So that the oh. district, the district, that decision making authority of flagpole versus a different location within their building is made at the district board level. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a question. It's a really good one uh, that we've got to figure out through the, the hard work of this policy committee. What I had to read several times, but I'll, I'll just quote the first sentence of the second paragraph. Therefore, it is the policy of the White River Valley Supervisor Union that its superintendent slash principal shall designate a space in each of the district school buildings for the display of flags. And so I kept going and going on that. I'm saying that's terrific. It's, it's an opportunity for our students to express themselves and to have space within the school. Um, they could do so. And then you have a, a procedure to do that. What was it appeared to me was unclear was therefore what about display not in the school? And I took the second draft to mean that you're talking about displays in the school and our flagpole would still remain for our blessed American flag and, um, and the state flag. And if that's, if you're meaning to just differentiate the two, um, I think it needs to be, it needs to be clear if that's the case. And it sounds like you're not there. this draft was trying to differentiate that. I think what Maggie's saying is the policy committee doesn't know if that's what they want. Right. Yep. We're not there yet, Bill. So yep. more mm -hmm. information to come. Yep. Well, I just just my two cents worth is I love where you're going to. So there's a display opportunities in all our schools. I won't address whether it's SU or the district level, but I happen to believe that our flagpole outside our school building should be reserved for the United States flag and our state flag. Um, and uh, we we achieve both our ends uh, through that uh, that mechanism. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Chris? Uh, hi, Chris Jarvis, Red Board. Um, so conversation that we had um, two meetings ago in regards to the, the draft, uh, I think it was I don't know if it was the first draft, second draft um, that I had brought up was more, I, I think, uh, you know, having parameters for the children uh, to, to express themselves um, is great, as we talked about. But the issues that I see personally, as well as researching it, is, is the potential issues of the decision makers and who makes the decision for the symbol to go on the flagpole. And what I mean by this is you could have two different flags or two different symbols that meet all the criteria to move forward for a vote, either at the, let's say, a superintendent or a board level. But you could have one symbol that gets approved and one that doesn't. And what that does at that point is it opens up the board or the individual making the decision to um, litigation. And this is what we've seen across uh, the region as well as um, nationally. And that's why you've seen some issues like Wyndham County and uh, Orange uh, Southwest, I think, had reversed their decisions here recently because they could not figure out about the decision piece of it. So they went back to having a restrictive policy. So I, I guess one thing I would just stress is because um, it seems like a lot of thoughts going into, you know, inside versus outside or different flag poles. But who is going to be the ultimate decision maker here? And is this going to be a fair process for all children, um, given when they submit a symbol that meets all the criteria? So um, and, and looking at the drafts right now, 
you know, it wouldn't be fair for Jamie to make the decision on all these symbols or his predecessor or whoever might come after him, nor would it be um, fair for a board um, that could have views in one way or another to make the decision. So uh, one thing I had brought up, and I know it's not an easy solution, was the potential of having the children vote for it. Um, you know, they could vote, they could learn a little bit about democracy um, and exercising their vote. They could, you know, you could put, uh, you know, ballot boxes out to be voted on uh, in the school system uh, for a certain symbol that could go up for a period of time. But those are kind of the, uh, what I had stressed at my board level. So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chris. And I, and I do think we're thinking about all those things about who makes the decision and all of that. So we're not definitely not decided in any one way yet. No. All right, anything else for the policy committee? Okay. Uh, negotiations council update. Sarah, you wanna run with this? Oh, no, you were not here. So I can't even give, I can't even assign it. You All can right. because I am up to date. I'm um, with her today. Okay, well, all right, since you're up to date, uh -huh. you roll with it. So um, the team minus me has met with, uh, so we're open, our bargaining with the support staff um, and um, we have agreed upon Thursday evenings as um, every other Thursday evening as a uh, time to meet with them. We've agreed upon ground rules and we will um, be moving forward on the 8th of uh, December. Thank you, Sarah. You were up to date. Good job. <laughs> it wasn't earlier, but I am now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, appointment. Uh, appoint to a W or VSU member Benti Development Committee of the Right River Valley SU Board. So this is where we talked about um, coming up with a committee to talk about board mentors and work on that <coughs> program. Uh, the one person we talked about we tagged an effort to do it, it has declined. So I need to go back to my board to, to see if I can wrangle somebody to do it. Um, so I don't, does anybody else have, do, do we have any other interests? Well, yes, I do. yeah, I, I would, Stratford definitely had a two. I, some of the boards I meet, I missed this conversation due to me having two at the same night, but it might be worth going around to each board. I'd hate to hold this up because mm -hmm. you wanted to have this done by the end of February. Right. Right. So I don't know if every board has to have representation right. on the committee. So I know in Stratford, we actually had two. Okay. Which was Eric. Jessica. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> so it's Eric and Jessica. All right. Um, Fred, is somebody from Fred, did anybody have interest from that board? Or we landed on that. I don't think we went there. Um, we didn't have anybody volunteer. Um, okay. I might try and join, I guess. <laughs> we'll stretch them, but I can try. Thank you, Andrew. We'll put Andrew down for now. Um, the, our said um, Christine Kavak has volunteered to do join the uh, mentor uh, study committee. Nice. Justine. Yes. <laughs> Sharon, Sylvia, I missed that part of the meeting. No one volunteered, and we just talked about how it's harder for us because there's only three of us, mm -hmm. and people were feeling a little bit spread thin between other committees. Like, I'm on the policy committee already. Yeah. Um, so people were going to think about it, but I didn't hear back from the other two board members that there was interest. Okay. Stacy, did you volunteer? Thanks for asking, Jamie. <laughs> uh, not yet. I have put word out to see if there are and if there's other interest on my board. I have not had any bites yet. Like Andrew, I feel pretty spread thin, but if no one steps up, I would and I'll I'll step up for Sharon if nobody else does. Well, and I don't know if you all need to attend every one either, but right. if we can 
make that many of an appoint appointments, then I could then start to organize you as a committee and start, we could start getting the meetings warned um, and then move forward with that work. And these will be on Thursday nights, correct? Yes, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. So it makes some of the, the people on the negotiations committee we Like Stacy, you're probably not. But even if Stacy's not, we have one, two, three, we have five, and even if Andrew couldn't be there, we have four at least. I also think if we're, I mean, are we negotiating every other week or are we still going to meet in? in You're right. That is true, Stacey. Yeah. Right. So Not that I like myself. having Thursdays to myself. You were trying to help. Thursdays are overrated. I'm totally dropping in for some if we tend to, Stacey. So I think we have enough to appoint. A group and just know that some of us on the negotiations group won't be able to be there on that night. Good. Yeah, these are appointments, so you don't need a formal motion. So, I'll, I'll also suggest the revision of the um, meeting was really helpful. So, to, to the extent that we can maybe fly, fly in every once in a while, that, that would be, I think, greatly appreciated. <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> All right, so this is good. I got this, the full board. There's a good with these appointments, and I will get an email out to this group. All right, thank you, guys. Um, discussion draft number two of the 2024 budget. Okay, I can go. Jump in. So Terry can talk to you about the numbers. The only change uh, since we met with you last month is an increase um, in projected health insurance costs, which Tara can talk to you about where we were budgeted versus what we're projecting now, and the addition of the 504 coordinator, as discussed last month within the student support budget. So what you'll see here is the student support budget, due to our work, I believe, with our response to intervention, multi-tier system with supports, is that we are, and, and a kudos to, to the whole team, right? You don't see our special ed budget go down without the hard work of universal and targeted supports. I think that, that is a, a real thing to highlight. And so the special ed budget is, um, as presented, is still down 59941 in the rest of your operating budget, which is, Fiscal services, it's uh, my office, it's curriculum instruction and assessment, it's all the other functions of the supervisory union at the instructional level and business office level is up um, at the bottom line of Tara. 76409 or 4%. Okay, so when you go across the two of them, oh, it's also got technology in that 76. Yep. Sorry, Ray. I'm going to miss your department. It's an important department, technology and communications. We, when you combine the two, which is what you are assessed with across the board, is the two. There's different assessment for special ed versus the rest of the um, functions, and you'll see those all in December. You're really looking at seventeen thousand dollars, or maybe just less. That's an estimate. Sixteen five, Tara said. So health insurance, we received notification from VHI that they filed with the Department of Financial Regulations for an average of 12.7% increase based on utilization. So that is what I had to adjust our health insurance increases to. I've done that. Um, you all saw that at your local board levels this month. Um, also in the state negotiated health insurance, there is a reduction in the HRA funding by $200 for the professional staff, no change in the support staff. So that reflection has also been made in the HRA funding in this draft of the budgets. Questions? How are folks feeling about the addition of the 504 coordinator now and what it does to the overall budget? I think this is something that we need. 
sounds like it's something that we do. Better serve this population, but I'm in support of it. I was too, especially after last month's session where um, we just learned about how much folks are carrying with responsibility and a lack of continuity. I think it's well spent money. Anybody else have comments about this draft of the budget? Bill? <laughs> Hi. Um, this is a question to Annette and, and Jamie. It's wonderful when we can, through sound management leadership and, and, and great staffing, reduce our budgets. And in special education, that's, that's amazing. My question to both of you is, um, we don't want to just hold the, not just, we don't want to hold the line. We want to continue to improve, move forward, strengthen our ability to take care to make sure every child under our supervision and responsibility gets everything he or she needs to, to achieve their fullest potential. Does this budget you're presenting here move us in a direction? I'm not saying how fast, and I'm not saying you're leaping over tall buildings with a single bound, but um, is it, do you feel confident and can tell us that this is this is going to make a difference uh, in a positive way, this budget, as you have presented it? Yes, because it's it's actually all the stuff that we need. Um, it, that's what's reflected in the budget to to run a really efficient um, and high quality department. So yes, I'm I, I'm. I'm very proud of our budget and I think it's it's wonderful and um and I so just just a clarity I was telling Mr. Kanani about this before some things that we should be proud about that I think is actually helping our budget is that you know we um have decreased the number of students that are currently attending um therapeutic uh schools outside of the district um, we've been able to bring back two students already this year, um, transition them back um, to our high school um, because we have the personalized learning classroom, that alternative classroom at the high school. Um, and so we've been able to transition two students back already. Um, and due to transitioning, graduation, um, and some others, it's projected to have six less students next year um so i so i think um yeah so just that in itself i think you know a is a huge budget saver um because on average you know it's 90 to a hundred thousand dollars per student um you know when we send them to you know schools outside of our district um yep. but i think it also talks to how well um the, our personalized learning classroom is and how important it is um, at the high school level. And um, I can't wait to do a, a presentation about all our alternative classrooms um, towards the end of this year, just because they are doing such amazing things. Um, and you know, the high school program just had a Thanksgiving feast um, today and each student um, you know, was able to bring in a dish that is tradition in their family because we do have different types of families that come from different backgrounds and cultures. Yeah. Um, and they were all able to share today and invite community members in and other staff and students into the room. And it was just, um, just brings tears to my eyes because it was just amazing about how proud they were and how proud you know their parents were to be able to attend. So. Anyway, I'm very proud of this budget, and I think it just meets the needs of all of our students. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you have anything else to add on that? No, uh, yeah, hit it perfectly. <laughs> I was going to say a big piece to this yeah. is it's not like it's cut, it's cut in staffing. No, it's it, not. It is not cuts in staffing. It's it's actually our ability through the, the program that you provided us permission to build. And remember, last year was only year one. At the, that 9 through 12 level, I think we're now starting to reap the benefits of keeping our students in the least restrictive learning environment, meet their needs, and it is resulting in more stable budgets. And attendance is Fantastic. Thank you. And school attendance is higher already. Um, so, yes. 
No, thanks for that question, Bill. So next month you'll see revenue as we get our December 1 letters before the next meeting and um, the rest of the funding for approval. <laughs> I'll be optimistic. Okay. All right, um, 22, 23 board bill possible action. Yeah, so um, Andrew, do you want to take the lead on this? I'm sure. <laughs> the board had, did receive these last month. And I know that we never expanded F. Um, Otherwise, I, I don't know if the board has further conversation or may be willing to approve and maybe somebody could wordsmith that. I do think it would be good to take action on these if possible. Yes. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think we can probably just drop F unless somebody wants to yeah, try and... When I was originally writing it, the first goal was basically adapted from Jamie's goals and the idea was like, how can we support Jamie in, in reaching his goals? So I'd gone through kind of each individual goal and kind of put what the board would do to help Jamie get there. And I just kind of ran out of steam on F and <laughs> was hoping we'd get some people to, you know, get some suggestions on what we might be able to put there instead. But we can also just drop that one. And I think the rest of them are pretty strong. Um, so yeah, the first one was mostly mimicking Jamie's goals. And then the ones after that were ones that we came up with during the uh, board retreat. Um, and yeah, um, I think the other one that might have needed a little bit of work was the creating a board mentoring program, because I thought that that goal could be kind of what we'd like to get the subcommittee to bring back to us for um, the mentoring program, not like specifically what it would look like, but kind of how, um, you know, what, what we'd like the subcommittee to come up with. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about the goals. <laughs> I think they're great. I think you did a great job. Um, I can't, and I'm trying to think of F of how to expand on that, and nothing's popping right into my mind. I, I'm not sure that F needs to be expanded. I think if you get rid of everything yeah. after reputation, that, that, that in itself is a, a laudable goal, and you can just stop there. I, like I mean, that. Not, that, not that we're going to stop at our reputation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but, but the notion of the board helping to improve the reputation of of the district um, is is a, a measurable. It's not a measurable goal, but it sure should be a goal of the board. I agree. So, an F. We're just going to take out the the last word by and just leave it as help improve the WRVSU's um, yeah. reputation, and then leave it from leave it there. I think that's actually a really good idea. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Bill, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was going to suggest uh, that it, it'd be wonderful if we could vote this unanimously tonight. Um, but voting it uh, and making it our commitment is possibly two different things. What this is all about is that we commit ourselves, every one of us, to do what we could do to achieve these goals in this calendar in this uh, school year, and so. It's important that everybody reads it and says, yeah, I, I'll commit it. It's not that we're all going to be on 100 committees. It isn't going to be that we're all going to be volunteering and, and not having to spend any time with our families or friends. But this is a serious act that we're saying, hey, uh, vote. Uh, we're committed to improve our SU and our, and our district schools. And this is what we're committed to do, do in this next year. We may achieve everything and, and you know, um, hallelujah, we might miss some of these targets. 
Um, this is no guarantee that we'll do everything perfectly, but it is a commitment. And I'd just like to say, if we are ready to commit uh, to do the best we can as an SU board and district boards, then I'd, I'd, I'd love to move it tonight, Kathy, and, 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 and get it voted and, and, and move it ahead. Well, all right, Bill, so would you like to make a motion? Um, oh, I would. Sorry, wait, Stacey had her hand up first. No? No, I lowered it. Thank you. All right, Bill, so would you like to make a motion? Um, I move that in order to strengthen the supervisory union and individual district governance and oversight, the White River Valley Supervisory Union Board will adopt the following goals for the 2022-2023 school year and as listed. Second. Is there any discussion before I call the vote? All right, so I'm gonna yeah. um, I'm gonna call each board member and just vote, please. Uh, Andrew. Hi. Aye. Aye. <coughs> Who did you just ask? Bill. Uh, aye. Sylvia. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Sarah. Aye. Tammy. That's all, Tammy. Tammy, are you there? I'm here, but I'm not a board member. I'm a public member. Oh, sorry. We were thinking. We have a Tammy that's also a board member. Sorry. So, Stacy, it's up to you. I am an I. Thank you. Sue? I. Is that all the board members on the phone? Uh, Mary yep. Ann is still on it. Mary Ann. Mary Ann, are you available to vote? You get Shannon? You did, right? We got Shannon, yep. That's fine. I then we got. Uh, Rodney's an I and Kathy's an I. We're still good. So we are good. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks for all the hard work everybody's been putting in too. Hmm. All right. Um, next. Current status of draft number three of the strategic plan. Yeah, so um the good news is I have uh, undivided attention to getting draft three completed for formatting tomorrow. As long as everyone in this office lets me have that time to do that work. And that's why, I, I, yes. Do we note it? All right. So I'm going to focus on that. I want to thank Bill for meeting with me um, and sharing some of his feedback. I feel really good about the direction of draft three. I want to thank everyone who's provided feedback on this. Um, that goes from the board, administration, staff have provided feedback. I feel really strongly that a draft three will be uh, ready for board discussion and possible action in December. I want to remind the board to provide feedback to me directly if you have it on draft two. Um, draft three does. Um, the other highlights around draft three is it will have a conclusion. It will have actionable tasks within the fiscal department. Um, that's going to be a little clearer based on the work that we're currently doing. Um, and maintenance and facilities and the work of the board. It will incorporate the, the strategic plan incorporates some of the tasks that you've laid out for yourselves as a board. Um, within the strategic plan. So I do think it's going to finally fill it out. Um, and Bill, did I miss anything? You got it. All right. All right. Any comments, questions, discussion on the strategic plan and where Jamie's at? All right. Thanks everybody for your comments and help on this. All right.
So EPA electric bus grant. Yeah, and so, and I may actually ask uh, members, although I don't think there's a lot of mem uh, board members that are on the actual energy committee on tonight, um, but Ray is on the energy committee, so he can fill in some gaps for me too. So as an SU board, um, we went through the application process to pursue um, a grant for electric buses and the infrastructure to support electric bu buses um, last spring. That grant and that work was sponsored by Two Rivers Out of in the energy committees that represent Stratford and Sharon, uh, the towns of Stratford and Sharon. Um, and there's been membership from those groups on our SU energy committee. Um, and also our set is represented by Patrick Hudson. The SU did receive uh, a significant grant that would cover the purchase of three electric buses. The way that that process would work is the SU would purchase the electric vehicles, and then we essentially would lease them back out to our transportation provider. Our transportation provider would be responsible for the upkeep of the vehicles, the maintenance of the vehicles, and the electricity used to charge the vehicles, just like our provider currently pays for diesel fuel, they would then pay for the electricity that's metered. The infrastructure we would look to build on one of our campuses within the SU because I don't want that. I want that here because those buses, if we choose to go with a different provider, would be leased by that other provider, but we will want the charging infrastructure with us. So a reminder that we're currently up for bid on our transportation services and so it would be important that, th that we hold the the charging system on one of our campuses the what are, as far as butler bus goes they have demonstrated support and it's actually they are also the transportation provider um, for also uh, windsor central woodstock who also received the grant so we know we we do have support from our current uh, providers. That would be something during the bid process that would be a follow-up question for us if if we select to go with a different provider to make certain that they are willing and supportive of using electric vehicles. Because those vehicles stay with us. They don't stay with the provider. Okay. So why would we want three electric vehicles? Well, one, it aligns with the work of the Energy Committee and the work of our state around renewables. And two, we're actually, we would get new equipment at no charge for us and actually see a payback because currently part of our contract with service with our providers is they purchase the buses and part of what we, we pay for that, we pay that down. We could see savings in our contract because we actually would own three of our buses that they would lease from us. The, other piece to this grant is it does pay for the infrastructure. The districts right now that we would look to leverage these vehicles with based on talking with our transportation service would be to leverage them in Stratford and in Sharon. We currently have two buses in Stratford and one bus in Sharon. Also the charging infrastructure could be well suited um, there, you could, either way, wherever we decide to put the charging infrastructure, the bus could be easily accessed off the highway and serve that other member district. You see what I'm saying? Whether they're charged in Sharon, whether they're charged in Stratford, either way, it's easy for that driver to get the bus and start their routes. Um, and those two towns really were the energy and sponsorship behind us pursuing this. We have not accepted the grant yet. This is still in conversation. Uh, we do need to make a decision by next month um, in regards to whether or not we want to accept this grant. Um, and I'm coming to the board to share this information and say that, you know, it would be three electric vehicles, the grant would cover and the infrastructure. And we know that our current transportation company is 
more than supportive in in regards to this and they transportation company was at the energy committee as well uh, not this last meeting but prior prior and jeff martin who represents Stratford and Sharon at Two Rivers out of Quichi, um, did do a lot of work with Tara um, to pursue the grant. And I see Sue's got a question. Go ahead, Sue. Um, so the, the way it works right now, so the, the SU pays for all the transportation costs, you allocate it back to each district. So with these buses, regardless of where they're located, lower the total transportation costs so we all receive benefits even if they're just located in different towns that is what i discussed with jeff and butlers yes because I, okay. I even if those are the districts using it i want everyone to reap the benefits of it yeah. okay thanks that's great any other questions i do okay. uh, what's the lifespan of these buses if you get three new ones how long how many years do they go well, the grant says we have to use them for five. They want to see them operational for five. I asked the bus I mean, company what, that. What do we do it's, with them then? Though? It's they're fairly new, right. transportation, right? right? And so the longevity, I don't have like actionable data on. Did that come up in your energy committee? No. My sense was that right now what we currently do is try to recycle our buses every ten years. Is what I've been told yeah. by Butler. Right. They're they're feeling like. That would stay on schedule. Mm -hmm. That's what Butler said. Yeah. Um, my other big question, actually, I have was logistics. Like uh, my question was, how do they perform actually in inclement weather? Mm. Was a big question I had. And Butler said that they actually weigh about twenty five hundred pa pounds more, and so they felt like they would that they would be fine. My worry was they're actually going to be lighter, right? And so that they wouldn't perform as well. Right. Um, but they're actually heavier, which for me was not where my brain went. It's got to be the whole the the battery. Battery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's got a battery, and then you still have the electric engine. So, yeah, I just, yeah. you know, I'm, yeah, clearly I'm not an engineer. No. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go to school for that. <laughs> oh, good. Afy. <laughs> Hi, um, congratulations on making that happen. It seems like really potentially great news. Um, I wanted to know if you have spoken to Butler about potential backup or contingency plans. Um, so will they still have buses available, traditional buses available if one breaks down or if something doesn't work, if they, I don't know, don't perform in snow or if they do, but like whatever. Um, just yeah, make yeah sure we'll, that still there have that, we'll still have three diesel buses always available to us as backup to, without incurring additional costs correct to okay great thank you and chris hey yeah again i i support the um you know trying the electric buses and in the thought process of i i think it's kind of a no-brainer when we're in our own area but what happens if we take one of these buses for either sports or arts or something and we drive out of our area to another school that may not have the infrastructure have we thought about how how will we charge these things abroad yeah the plan of what uh, that uh, yes chris that that is why we'll still have our three diesel buses as backup because the plan is that we would use these for their normal routes we wouldn't use them at, on actual longer extending trips at this point in time they, I did ask how many miles can they serve? 200 on miles round trip on not a cold day is what I was told. And we do know too that the Stratford and Sharon routes are well within that radius. And so that's the other reason why we were looking to um, deploy those in Sharon and Stratford. But if, if, if Sharon and Stratford had a longer trip then they would use one of our diesel vehicles. Interesting to see how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Hope it works. Uh, Shannon, I did see your question. Um, oh, I missed it. Sorry. Uh, so uh, it's as far as board members, all board members can speak at the meeting publicly. It doesn't matter board member, voting member, not voting member. Um, voting yeah, when it comes time that. to voting, then then it matters. So. 
Chris is speaking as a board member. All right, any other questions? Yeah, actually, I just want to follow up on that. I have always extended invites to all 31 board members for our full board meetings um, to come participate in discussion. So, it, it, and I just, I share this with all of you to encourage your other board members to come. I just think there's a lot of information we discuss and share here. And the more we can have all of our board members at the meeting participating in the conversation, even if they're not voting, the better. Stacy, uh, Jamie, you'd mentioned that you haven't yet accepted this grant. Do you need board permission in order to do so? If you are all willing to do it, um, I did not warn it for action, so I, I will just warn it for action next month. Okay, great. Thank you. But it's good to hear that it seems like the board's favorable. So I'll put it on for action next month. Okay. Do we have Mary Ann on? We do, but Sue is on too, so it doesn't good. We added Sue, so we've got enough. You know what I mean? Yep. Sue on. All right, guys. Uh, 10.2 uh, Public complaint against board member policy A1. Did everybody have the opportunity to read um, the information that Jamie sent out? And we should give the complaint to the speaker. Sure. Mm -hmm. Kate. 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 Kate um, and Kate, oops, since this is your document, the, the complaint that you sent in, would you like an opportunity to speak? Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yeah. No. Okay, sorry about that. I was on the road earlier, so I didn't have a great opportunity to be able to respond. No problem. Um, okay, so um, I'm Kate Jarvis. I currently reside in Woodstock, but my, my two daughters go to Bethel and Royalton schools, and they have since 2005 since we relocated to Woodstock, to Bethel, or excuse me, to Bethel, Vermont. So um, my daughter graduated in 2020, and I have two other daughters who attend the middle school and the high school currently. And I'm sorry, I'm nervous. I don't like public speaking. Um, over the past 17 years, I've done nothing but support our teachers, administration, and community. So thank you for hearing and considering my concern without judgment tonight. I wanted to, to speak directly to Hillary Hoffman or to answer her, her um, response earlier in just saying that with the utmost respect as Shannon's friend and an environmental attorney, I also had an attorney review my, my very concerning and official complaint and he's a Vermont civil and corporate law attorney. And he strongly felt that Shannon's actions warrant not only action by the board pertaining to the conflict of interest, but also potential litigation action in the courts. Um, and to provide further clarification in the matter, when Hillary mentioned not agreeing to other actions being taken, I, I believe she was referencing the fact that I did report Shannon's actions, the public context, conduct and unethical behavior to the New Hampshire Licensing Board. Uh, she and I are both licensed professionals in the state and we're held to a standard of ethics regarding conduct and discrimination. I being a realtor and her being a nurse. And so we've both been through extensive training and courses to be able to uphold these standards of conduct. The state did see the need to further investigate the situation and I'm hoping that the board also, also see that this conduct and ethic, the ethics are completely inappropriate and unethical. So I do ask, I do have two questions. Um, for one, it seemed that there was some trouble in getting members to sign up tonight or sign on 
to form a quorum. So respectfully, I do ask um, just to see a show of hands or members to show that everybody has been able to fully read the complaint, the formal complaint in its entirety. And then also um, in, in the case that the board chooses to take no action tonight, what would be the next steps or proper channel so that the complaint, which is that of many parents in the community, can be heard and addressed by a neutral board or um, panel or council? Thank you. Um, so I did ask the board whether they had an opportunity to review the, um, the material and nobody indicated that they hadn't. Um, I'm not sure what next steps are. So we're going to have further discussion with everybody. And I can't um, see who's speaking. I'm sorry. This is Kathy, the board chair. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, but thank you for your comments. So can everybody that, confirm that they had an opportunity to read it in, in its entirety? Um, I'm, I'm not. I, everybody, did you have the opportunity to, to, to read the materials sent to you? Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you, board. Um, Shannon, I'd like to give you an opportunity to speak as well, please. So I do have a statement. I am going to link it to the message board so that it can be included in the minutes. And I'll read it. Thank you. Uh, just for the, <laughs> wow. Um, anyway, you can imagine how frustrating this is for me as a scientist when the complaint we are answering isn't even correct in its most basic facts. I'm not a nurse. For the record, I live in South Royalton. I was appointed to an empty Royalton seat in 2022 after I moved from Bethel. <sighs> Sorry, I'm also getting over a cold. <clears throat> but I have been elected to the Rudd board many times. My seat is up for election in 2023. I am currently not employed in New Hampshire and I'm a genetic counselor. That is what my license is for. However, my residence and employment has no bearing on the matter that this complaint raises. Regarding the substance of this complaint, which is very confusing, but seems to involve an allegation that I have a conflict of interest under 16 VSA section 563 based on some of my Facebook activity, none of my private interests are at risk of benefiting from or being harmed by my actions as a member of this board. Other than the stipend we all receive for our work annually of about $600, I have no financial conflict of interest. I do believe that we all gain an emotional and psychological benefit from a sense of accomplishment that our work on the board, uh, and I don't see that as a conflict. The law cited in this complaint is a statute that outlines the way that school districts throughout Vermont can form school boards. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of feedback. And it contains general guidance as far as the powers and duties of school board members who are elected by the residents of each town. This statute provides that board members shall establish policies and procedures designed to avoid the appearance of board member conflict of interest. However, the statute does not provide for administrative or judicial review of the school board members' actions relative to the provisions of the law. Thus, <clears throat> while it is binding upon boards, there is no enforcement mechanism for a citizen parent or other individual citizen claiming to be aggrieved by a board member's conduct to challenge that board member's conduct by way of this law. Similarly, there is no power conferred on a school board to create a mechanism for administrative or judicial review of complaints against a board member. 
The statute the complainant cites does not confer power on the electorate to take, I'm sorry, it does confer power on the electorate to take action directed at a school board member, but this is through the ballot box, not by appeal to the board. As far as the complaint's factual allegations, they are similarly devoid of an argument. I clearly stated during the Facebook debate in question <coughs> that only a quorum of the board can make decisions or take actions on behalf of the board. I made it clear to all potential readers of the posts I made in my individual capacity and using my personal Facebook account that they were offered in my personal capacity, not as a representative of this or the Rudd School Board. I am not required to make that statement when I speak publicly outside of school board meetings, but I did on that occasion so it would be absolutely clear to those I was speaking to and with and to any who might read my comments that I was speaking as an individual and not on behalf of our board. The complainant has, through her actions, demonstrated that she fails to comprehend that an elected or appointed public official has a First Amendment right to speak in their individual capacity, a right which is protected by the Vermont and U.S. constitutions. However, her failure to understand this basic constitutional right does not divest me of the right. The complainant has, for some reason, become so angry about my defense of the rights of transgender children in our school district that she has begun targeting me in my personal and professional capacity since I participated in the Facebook discussion in question. She has defamed me to the New York, uh, to the New Hampshire State Medical Licensing Board staff made complaints against my New Hampshire license, specifically that I committed sexual discrimination on the basis of race and gender with my recent Facebook posts. Based upon information and belief, she has also personally targeted other members of our community who have publicly spoken out in favor of protecting transgender students' civil rights and their rights to privacy. In short, it is important for my colleagues on the school board to know that the complainant has taken it upon herself to threaten my livelihood, the income upon which my family depends, and my career, along with the livelihoods and income of other parents in this community who have defended transgender kids' civil rights and their rights to privacy. Aside from this complaint, Kate has on many days in the past month contacted our SU eight to nine times per day, harassing them on this issue and taking our superintendent away for multiple hours each day from the very important work on education in our communities. If Kate and others want me off this board, they will need to find someone to run against me who can win. It's just that easy. That is the political process in this country and you don't have to like it, but you do have to live with it. To conclude, I am outspoken, I use colorful language, I have a sarcastic streak a mile long, and I curse like a sailor, except with an earshot of small children. I am a fierce ally for LGBTQ and BIPOC rights and the amplification of those voices. I have never tried to hide any of this. I believe that the people in this community know who I knew who I was when they elected me multiple times to the school board, and those who stand for values like mine vastly outnumber the ones who would stand against us. Even if the numbers changed, I cannot imagine adopting a position that would result in discriminatory treatment of any children representing marginalized groups in our society. It is not my value set, and it is thankfully not the value set of this school board. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. I have board. Um, is there questions? There's any clarifying questions for either group? Is there um, from the board or from? From the board too. Board, do you have any clarifying questions from either party? Um, hi, this is Stacy. 
I just quickly wanted to circle back um, to Hillary's question in the chat, um, asking if there was an attorney representing Kate Jarvis. Hillary says the v Vermont Bar Association's ethical rules require the disclosure of the attorney's name. I am not a Vermont Bar Association member nor an attorney, uh, but uh, so so. Um, I have not fact checked that claim, but I would like to, I would like to hear if there is an attorney involved. Kate, would you like to answer that question? Sure. I have no attorney representing me at this time. I've had an attorney review the complaint that I filed. Thank you. Thank you. Can I clarify? Go ahead. Just to clarify, I have had days. I want the board to to know this. I've had days that I've had folks reach out to me about this particular concern. And there are days that it's been eight or nine times. Those are not all just from Kate Jarvis. I wanted that to be on the record. May I speak as well when I have a chance? Go ahead. Thank you, Kate. Um, sure. So I am not an attorney and, and I'm not going to pretend to be and that's why I need the help of an attorney, obviously at some point. Um, but there are many, many hey, parents who feel- can you turn your feel, camera on so we can see you, please? No, no, thank you. Do I need to? I'm in the car sitting after work. Let me see if no, I can figure no. out how to. No, you're fine. You're fine, Kate. You don't have to. No, if you need, I don't even know. I'm in sitting in the car after a long day of work. Let me see if I can figure out how to. No, I really can't right now. <laughs> It's fine. Anyway, I have been in touch with numerous parents who do not dare to speak up to our school board. They do not dare to speak up to our administration. They have been silenced. They don't dare to say anything. Their children have been bullied because of the behavior of board members like Shannon. So I have received so many comments that I have documented that I am prepared to take to the next step. And I have received so many comments saying, thank you for speaking up and thank you for stepping up for us. Because we don't dare to say anything because we will be called names and we will be bullied and we will be called this and be called that, like Shannon is trying to do. But I'm, I'm not coming from a bad position or an ill position. I'm trying to speak up and say that what's going on, that public conduct and public comments were not right. It's unethical, it's not okay, and it's not welcoming to our community, and it is in conflict of interest. It's She's voting on policies, and she's voting on resolutions that are being passed on flag policies and many, many different policies. There's a conflict of interest, and I provided plenty of proof in my formal and official complaint. So, Kate, thank you. And, and so, so, you know, it's up to the board tonight to decide what we'll be Absolutely. deciding tonight is, is whether the, we find this a conflict of interest. So that's, that's what we're tasked with. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, board, do you have it? You're welcome. Board, do you have any other questions? And can I say that we consulted with people and they said that it's what they found, what Dana told them? And, and so, um, Andrew, Jamie and I spoke with our legal um, about this, um, and and um, Dina said, Dina, our attorney said that it, she's not finding that it's that it meets the con matches to the conflict of interest policy. That that this is not a conflict of interest. We went through the reasons. We talked for a period of time about it. Andrew, you're on the call. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I think her, the conflict of interest really is about whether you're receiving personal gain for it. It's not whether you have beliefs that are, you know, cause you to think one way or the other about an issue and whether those beliefs are public, that's, you know, separate. I don't think that that, if, if that were the standard, it's kind of an impossible standard to reach because we wouldn't be able to say anything publicly without it being a conflict of interest. Um, so it, the conflict of interest policy for Nadina was really about kind of material or social, you know, like an actual 
gain that you would receive for taking a position. And it doesn't seem like there's anything that Shannon is getting, like she's not receiving anything thing for taking these positions or that's just what she believes and expresses. So um, that's what I got from the conversation with Dina. I, that I, that's the same thing I got, Andrew. So that, that's a fair assessment. But is there any other questions or comments from the board? Stacy. Hi. Um, so I was not on the call with Dina, but thank you to those of you who took that call, um, who took the time out of your day to to gather this feedback. Um, I, I, this is a question for Kate Jarvis and. Um, you know, when you, you'd mentioned um, kind of bullying and other parents who were expressing fear um, about standing up. And I wonder if, is there something outside of what you supply to us, which to me looks like a social media difference of opinion in which this Facebook provides that. Uh, yeah. provide Stacey, Stacey yeah. I, don't think we, I don't think we wanna, I think we wanna just stick to this topic and this task for tonight. Oh, okay. No. So I would say based, you know, in my opinion, based on just what we've reviewed, it seems like that's exclusive to social media disagreement. And I would recommend, you know, that's what the it board needs to decide. It, it on is tonight. not. It goes I, much okay. further. Okay. So, sorry. I'm trying to listen to, to the board chair. Um, that's what we need to decide on tonight. Stacy. So that's why I'm saying that's what we need to, to focus on. And what I see here tonight. Right. Whether this is a conflict of interest or not, and whether we feel it's a conflict of interest. And that's the extent of it. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Maggie? Hi. So does that mean um, uh, then that the next step is like, do we uh, do we take a vote or do we move? Yeah, how, what, what's the process here? Maybe, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Can I jump in for just a second? Yeah. So this is Eric Lopez from Stratford Board, not a voting member of the full board. Um, I, I read through the complaints fairly carefully, um, and I believe the complainant is asking for two things. Um, she's asking for an, a finding by this group, this board, um, that that the actions of the respondent, the board member, violated state statute, as well as a finding that it violated the, the conflict of interest, interest policy. Uh, I would suggest that this board does not have the power or jurisdiction to make a finding of a violation of state statute. So as a preliminary matter, um, in, in regards to the complaint, I would suggest the board should consider whether it has that power and come to the conclusion that it does not and, and dismiss that portion of, of the relief that is being, being sought. The second part, part of the complaint talks about specifically um, three sections of the um, conflict of interest policy. Um, and I, I went through each of the three sections that are um, being re referred. And I think the board ought to spend some time talking about each of the three sections and why it is um, that it feels that it does not come to rise to the level of a violation of uh, uh, any of those sections. And I can suggest that the three set, three um, sections that were appointed were sections one, sorry, I think it's a one, two, and five. One is a board member will not give the impression that he or she would represent special interests or partisan politics or personal gain. Um, and as it relates to that particular section of the policy, it's really difficult to see as a result of the evidence presented that any of the um, conversation had on public media of, of, of Facebook has any any bearing on personal gain. To be able to say that um, advocating for a particular group um, equates personal gain is is going down a rabbit hole that as a, as, as a board, I think we should not be going down. The, the second um, uh, the second portion that she points to is that she has the authority to make or take action on behalf of the board. And as she has clearly stated, um, she took steps to, the respondent clearly stated, she took steps to distance herself from the fact that she herself 
could make act, uh, take actions on behalf of the board. So, so on that particular subsection of the policy, I would suggest that there have been no facts presented in order for the board to make a finding. The third is that her position will be influenced by anything other than a fair representation of all sides of the question. Um, and, and it's difficult for me to understand based on social media posts where there is no question bef before uh, the, uh, the board um, that, that the fact that she, that the, the respondent is um, advocating for a particular group or set of individuals equates a, um, or, or t takes the step into um, uh, not being willing to listen to all sides. So as it relates to the evidence presented by the complainant through her complaint, uh, I would suggest this vote, uh, this board ought to take the position when it votes um, that, it, that, that there is no evidence to make a finding of violation of the policy. Um, the last thing that I will say, I promise, um, it is, is that um, the policy talks of three and only three things that the board is allowed to do by virtue of a complaint being brought to the board. Um, it can either dismiss the complaint in the way that um, Ms. Hoffman has suggested, Attorney Hoffman, sorry, um, or, or it can do one of two things. Um, it, it can um, exclude the individual from further conversations from something that hasn't come up to the, to the board's attention, or, or it can um, publicly admonish um, the, the, the individual. Uh, th that is the only, the sole remedy that is available under this policy. So to the extent that board members feel and vote to, um, that, that there has been a violation of policy, I would suggest that the discussion then can only center uh, around those two potential um, remedies. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I spent time looking at this. Yeah. <laughs> Explained it very well. Thank you. Um, any other questions or discussion from the board? Um, I'll make a motion that we issue a public finding that the conflict, the conflict of interest charge is not supported by the evidence and is therefore dismissed. Second. Any discussion on the a vote on the proposal. Right. You know, you suggested that we need to do, we need to do two votes. The way you suggested. Um, We're just dismissing no. it to get rid of it. Right, dismissing. Just okay. All right. So, Bill, go ahead. Bill, you're muted. Can, can you mute Susan? I mean, Susan, can you mute her? Bill, you're still muted. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? <laughs> Sorry about that. Boy, striking out. Um, before we vote, I think it's important for everybody listening and as part of this that um, as a member of a district school board and of the SU supervisory board, I took this complaint very, very, very seriously. Um, I reviewed our policy, A1 policy about conflict of interest. I read definitions of conflict of interest. I read the state law having to do with conflict of interest. And I agree we're following this policy as a board, our A1 policy, um, as it's been adopted uh, by all the district boards and the SU boards going back to 19, uh, 2018. And I'm saying this because regardless of our outcome, we take our responsibilities very, very seriously. And this charge and these um, time use that, uh, that was spent on both parties and dealing with this was excruciatingly painful. Um, it appears to me, I wasn't there, I wasn't part of them, but what I read of the record and heard from you tonight, um, really, 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 really rugged. And I think we all feel that 
Um, it was unfortunate that this came to pass. That, that's different than what our obligation is tonight, and that is to follow our conflict of interest policy. And it goes back to, as Andrew said, the definition of conflict of interest. And we cannot do our job unless we follow that policy and that definition. And I believe each one of us in our votes will uh, abide by that definition and how the implementation is defined uh, below it. Thank you. Any other comments before I call the vote? Can you just read the motion one more time, please? Uh, the motion that was that we issue a public finding that the conflict of interest charge is not supported by the evidence and is therefore dismissed. That's just the text that's in the conflict of interest policy for that option. Yes. So I think a yes vote is dismissing. This is dismissed. Right, it's an affirmative. Right, yeah, to dismiss. Yeah. All right, so we will start with Bill. Bill? Yes. Sue? Yes. Maggie? Yep. Andrew? Yes. Sylvie? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Stacy? Yes. 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 Oh, you don't get to vote. And Kathy's a yes. Do we lose our ninth? Wait a minute. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. No, that would be a conflict of interest. No, your, your three voting members are on tonight. It right. doesn't mean she just takes doesn't vote on one thing and then another board member swoops in and votes. She's still your representative tonight. Oh, okay. I, I, I appreciate it. I'm sorry. Rodney is our representative. It's Chris who's not our representative. Shannon, we've got it. Rodney, thank you. You are still the voting member tonight. You are just abstaining from the vote. Doesn't mean that an alternate gets to all of a sudden vote for you because you're here at the meeting. Right. I just thought Andrew and Rodney were our other two members. From the they, they were, and they both voted. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want everybody to know that that the comments that were on the social media page were Shannon's personal comments? They weren't representation of the board, and we voted on this policy based on the board and what we have the power and the ability to do. This is what we were tasked with. So it's not an opinion; it's just what our policy states, and that's what we voted on tonight. But thank you, everybody. Stacy. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you and Andrew and Superintendent Kinarni um, for taking the time to go through this and do the due diligence and bring the patient. I know that everyone, we've been talking all night about how thinly stretched we are. So I really appreciate um, how seriously you took this. Um, and I would say, um, the process is the process. You know, I welcome comment by any concerned parents about any of, you know, like we want people to be engaged in that communities and to bring things forward when they have concerns. Absolutely. Thank you, Stacey. Um, so Maggie raised her hand. Maggie. Hi, sorry, I was just trying to find the buttons. Um, yeah, I, I, I thank you for the process and uh, whether or not it's appropriate here. I also want to thank Shannon for being the voice of folks who need better representation. So I appreciate your words, Shannon. 
Thanks, Maggie. A Andrew? Um, so I do think we should, you know, like we adopt the code of ethics um, as a board generally, but we don't really have any policy for what to do, you know, in the instance that there's a complaint about the code of ethics side of things. So I do think as, you know, the policy committee and, and the board generally should consider what, like, you know, we have a, a set policy for the conflict of interest policy, which has very discrete rules and steps to take. And it would be nice if we had something similar for, you know, just general board conduct um, policy. So that's all. That can be something that we bring forward to the policy committee. Thank you, Andrew. Resignations, new hires, we have none. Any other business for the board tonight? Future agenda items. Do we want to talk about uh, whether or not we could uh, do the December meeting on the 27th or, or change the date? Good, good idea, Terry. I was just going to say that December 27th probably would be a tough. Can we do future agenda? Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on, Sarah. We're getting yeah. further ahead than Jamie wants us to. Future um, items. Go. I just want to make certain I capture them all. Um, and so you'll get your final draft and possible action on the budget uh, for next year. Um, you'll get a draft and possible action on your strategic plan um, as presented. You'll get your normal reports. Um, I'm trying to think about our data calendar. Is there a data report in December for full board? Sorry, I'm putting no, on the spot. That's good. I should know. I think it's January. Oh, I should know too. Action will be your annual financial management section. That has to be done in December. So that will speak up. So, can so sorry, your annual financial management questionnaire that we do every December that you review and accept? That's the big long sheet. Um, we will have the EPA grant on for action. And you'll get a data report on what Ray was just got discussing, ADM. Um, if we put together tuition students, so you get to see what that looks like across the SU. Um, and then, of course, the budget. All right. Did I miss anything in our normal reports? Right. And of course, just reminding the board, if you have agenda items, if you email Kathy and myself, we work to try to get those included on the agenda. Yeah. All right. So guys, Tuesday, December 27th is what we have for our next meeting date, which is the day after, you know, Couple days after Christmas, is that going to work for people? Want to make sure we have a quorum so we can look at moving that date, or we can keep that date. What are? It won't work for me. No. Well, it won't work for it. Won't work for me. We're probably moving it. Then. We're probably moving it then because we seem so to be early January. Quorum. We want to go the week before, guys, or do we want to go early January? I guess Shannon wrote on the 20th already. We could go the 22nd. No, the 22nd would interfere with um, negotiations. 20. Could we go to January? Oh, well, we are working on budgets, could, so we need. Or we could do the 19th. Could you guys do the 19th? I could do the 19th. Yes, I could do it. Sarah could. Anybody thoroughly object to the 19th? Of December, right? Correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't object on principle. I just have to check my calendar. <laughs> Looks like we're going to shoot for the, the 19th, guys. Okay. Hey, Jamie, is that too soon to get stuff ready? No, no, 19th. No. And sorry, it's Maggie again. Is this is this just full board? Or are we doing policy also? Probably do policy also. Probably so do policy, yeah. It would be a double whammy. Okay, I just need to double check on that, but I, I'll, I'll get back. 
Okay. But are we talking about the fly tomorrow? Yes. Now or on the 19th? <laughs> no, on the 19th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, no, we have passed that already. Stop. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so we remove our meeting to the 19th, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. And I want to wish everybody a very happy Turkey Day. Same to you, and I make a motion to adjourn. You know, Sarah, before you do, uh, just a fun fact of the day. Uh, the turkey was almost an eel. We were almost eating eel Thanksgiving, which I personally would have preferred. Um, so I will leave it with that. <laughs> nice fun fact. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Everybody have a great holiday. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.